One year ago, I had my good friend Jordan Harbinger on the show to talk about building social capital. Today, he's back on the show to talk about calling in that social capital through a series of unfortunate events with his business. Uh, he's had to reach out to his network, his connections, his friends, and request help in building a new business from the ground up. Without his work in building a strong network in the past, Jordan admits that he'd be in a much worse position today. So in this episode, we talk about why keeping score in relationships is a bad idea, how to get over asking people for help, something Jordan calls systematic network maintenance, and how to call in your social capital. You're a man of action. You live life to the fullest, embrace your fears, and boldly chart your own path. When life knocks you down, you get back up one more time, every time. You are not easily deterred or defeated, rugged, resilient, strong. This is your life. This is who you are. This is who you will become. At the end of the day, and after all is said and done, you can call yourself a man. Gentlemen, what is going on today? My name is Ryan Mickler, and I am the host and the founder of this podcast, The Order of Man. First and foremost, I want to welcome you to this show. This is the best show in the world of podcasting for men, I believe. Obviously, I'm a bit biased, but there's millions of men across the planet who would also agree with me. What we're doing here, guys, in case you don't know, is we're interviewing the world's most successful men, warriors, athletes, scholars, business owners, and anybody, frankly, that is going to help each and every one of us become a better man. That's what we're all about here. Again, I've said it before, in a world that seems to dismiss masculinity altogether, we are standing strong. We are calling men to step up more fully in their families, in their businesses, and in their communities. And so to that end, again, we're interviewing the world's most successful men. We're extracting their wisdom, their lessons, their skills, their tools, their resources, their strategies for making their life such a success. And then, of course, using that to help us make our lives a success. We also have a show that we do every week called Friday Field Notes, where you get to listen to me for 10 or 15 minutes on some thoughts that I've been having throughout the week. And then we just released a third show. You probably heard it last week. It comes out every single Wednesday. It's called In the Trenches. And if you haven't heard it yet, I definitely, definitely recommend that you do. We're going to start this off with 12 different shows. Get your feedback, get your input. And of course, you can let us know what you think. And then we'll, uh, we'll evaluate it from there. We'll decide if we're going to continue. But at the end of the day, the goal of that Wednesday show that we're releasing is to interview ordinary, everyday, average Joes like you and me who are doing good things and we're having some setbacks and we're overcoming some challenges and some hurdles. And this is real life. So we want to interview guys again like you and me who are in the trenches, who are doing the thing and talk about what's working, talk about what's not working and try to improve our lives. So I actually do not host that podcast. A good friend of mine, Everett Bubba Downs, he is the host of that podcast. Last week, it was me and him, but moving forward, it's going to be him and some other guests. So it's a very quick, actionable conversation with guys who are actually in the trenches doing the work. So make sure you tune into that. Outside of that, only one announcement that I have for you right now, and that is our band of brothers, The Iron Council. I know you guys have heard me talk about this over and over and over again. Uh, we had 10 or 11 people sign up just last week and it's a testament to what we're doing over there. And the goal within the Iron Council is a brotherhood. It's a, an organization, a group of men who are all working together to improve their lives, enhance their marriages, enhance the relationships they have with their children, lose weight, get in shape, run marathons, do Spartan races, start businesses, grow their bank accounts. I mean, you name it. What are you trying to accomplish? And then consider how are you accomplishing that and inside the Iron Council, we have the framework, the foundation, the skills, the tools, the resources. And I think one of the biggest things that we have available in the Iron Council is the accountability. You are not going to get accountability outside of the Iron Council like you will with what we've created there. These are motivated, dedicated, committed men who are improving their lives and they're working very, very hard to help you improve yours. So if you're interested you want to learn more about what we're all about and the things that we're up to in the Iron Council, in our brotherhood, head to orderofman.com slash Iron Council. Now, guys, as I said before, that is all the announcements that I have for you today. I want to jump right into this one. It is my privilege to introduce you to a good friend of mine. And what's really interesting is years ago, three years ago, I remember listening to Jordan Harbinger on his podcast and thinking how talented he was and how much I would like to connect with him. And again, I've had the privilege of getting to know him and building a friendship up over the past three years now. And this is actually his third visit on the show. And every single conversation I've ever had with Jordan 
has been packed with value and insight and wisdom. He actually reached out to me about a month or so ago after having left his previous business, The Art of Charm. I know a lot of you guys are familiar with The Art of Charm, and he informed me that he was striking out on his own. Again, I know a lot of you have listened to it. You're familiar with his previous company and probably follow it as well. So you probably also know that Jordan had a little bit of a falling out with the other founders and frankly, just found himself needing to tap into his social capital, which he has been building for years. And we've had previous conversations about this. But the thing that impresses me most about Jordan and again, getting to know him is that it is apparent. It is apparent to me that this is a man who applies in his own life what is teaching other people. And as much as I wish that we were having this conversation under different circumstances, uh, in this conversation, you're going to hear exactly how I believe he's going to crush his new business venture using the skills and the tools and the strategies and everything that he's been teaching other people for more than a decade in his business. So Guys, if you can, sit back, take some notes. You're going to want to implement this stuff in your life when it comes to building up your social capital, building out your networks, because you never know when you're going to need to use it. Jordan, what's going on, man? Glad you are on the show again today. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I'm on the the order of man. In my head, there's that low movie guy voice that says something like, order of man, right? That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you were talking about it the other day. I think you were talking about like morning podcast voice or nighttime podcast voice. I think you were, yeah. you mentioned something like that, which is a real thing, like a genuine thing. Yeah, it is morning podcast voice. And I was at social media marketing world and I was like walking next to my wife and I said, man, I wish my voice always sounded like this. Cause somebody said, where's Starbucks? And I said, oh, it's right across the street. And then you make a right. <laughs> and I was like, oh man, wouldn't it be cool if I sounded like that all the time? Wouldn't that be great? And Jen's like, oh, that's really funny. Traffic backed up on the 405 all the way down to Encinitas. <laughs> it's like, that sounds so rad. I would be a voiceover guy for like K-Rock or something. But it is interesting, even with podcasting, like you hear some guys who have the, just the beautiful, like golden radio voice, but then you hear guys like Adam Carolla who have the most annoying voice in the world and yet have a huge following in podcast base. Yeah. I can't say anything about Carolla because I go on there every month with him and Dr. Drew as a regular guest. So what I will say is this, the reason he's well known and does a great show is not because of his voice. Cause you're right. He does kind of say, well, uh, I don't really buy into any of that. <laughs> you know, that's a, yeah, that's a great, that's a great impression. But then you go, Oh, he's funny. His opinions are strong. He can argue really well. And then he's very quick on his feet. So yeah, he's one of those radio guys that he's not Larry King where they went, this is the guy. Right. Right. Exactly. And you know how he got that job. You might know this better than me, but I think he was like a construction worker and he called in every day to some other guy's radio show as a regular. And he was so damn funny. They started inviting him into the studio and then they just went, this guy's got a talent for this. So that's why he does TV shows like to catch a contractor, because that was his original vocation is that. And I think working on cars, radio was a thing he did because he didn't like his job. Interesting. I just remember him and uh, Jimmy Kimmel from The Man Show. That's that's what I remember. Well, you and I grew up on, and, and this leads into an, an interesting point, right? Because your whole business is you set a positive example for guys. Right. And pardon me if I'm telling you about your own brand, so feel free to correct me, but that's kind of what you're aiming at. I think that's pretty good, yeah. The Man Show was kind of the quintessential, wow, this should not be on television. This is really bad for oh, people. Oh, 100%. Completely inappropriate. I don't know how old I was, but I remember not being super impressed with it. I was already too old for it. And I think I was like 13 or 14 years old. And I remember them going, all right, juggies, which are the girls jumping on the trampoline. And I just thought, this is kind of dumb, you know? Right. And the guy who drinks the beer at the end. And I just thought this is like a very cliche thing. I knew it was a joke. And maybe when you were watching it, you knew it was a joke. But the problem is tons of my friends watched that and they thought it was great. And I don't think they thought, wow, this is so funny. Look at the satirical look at what it means to be a man. I think they went, guys like all this stuff and they drink a lot and they like boobs and they demean women. And it's like, they didn't see the satire in it. Definitely. No. And I'm not even sure now that I think about it, now that we're talking about this, was it satire or was it just a bad television show <laughs> that should not have been on TV? Maybe that's the point. It was just designed to confuse us, right? Yeah. Who knows? But there's plenty of stuff that is designed to confuse men in every aspect of their life, intentionally or not. When I was growing up, things were more or less black and white, even though things were changing. I cannot imagine being a 12 year old boy right now. Oh man. I, I mean, I've got, my oldest is 10 
And some of the stuff that he hears at school and from his teachers and his buddies, I'm like, are you kidding me? That's what other boys are talking about. That's what you're being taught. That's what you're learning. It's absolutely asinine, which is why I think it's so important that we step up as men in the family, because uh, frankly, they're just not getting it outside of the walls of our homes. I believe that. And I'm not conservative. You're much more. I mean, you and I have been friends for a long time. I think it's safe to say if there's a center, you're on the right of it and I'm on the left of it. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. We get along really well because I'm not one of those people who says, you own guns and it means you're a murderer now. You know, I don't (laughs) do that. And when I see your kid holding an assault rifle or something, I'm like, holy crap, that's intimidating and scary. But I also realize it's because I didn't grow up that way, not because everything Ryan does is wrong and everything I grew up with is right and normal. And I think that there's a problem outside of that because I would imagine some of the things that your kids are hearing in school are contrary to the things they're learning at home. And so they're confused. Well, I think where I'm at, I'm in Southern Utah, very small community, very, very conservative generally. And so I think there's probably a little bit more alignment between what they're being taught in school and what I'm teaching at home. Okay. Uh, We all have very similar cultural backgrounds, religious views and beliefs. So it's very similar, but I think outside of where we are in this little bubble, if you will, it's completely different. So we do have an advantage from that perspective. I'm in my own bubble and I've realized it recently as well, especially with the recent election. And so one of the things that I've been working on for the last, I don't know, decade is relationships. And that was what I came on the show to talk about. I I don't, was it a year ago? Actually a year. Exactly. I was looking at it. it was March 14th of last year and we actually titled it building social capital. Okay. So I thought well, this would be a really good conversation because now You talked about it. You came on the show. This is what you need to do. This is how you build social capital. And right now you're in the midst of some crazy and wild stuff that you're actually having to implement what it is you're teaching to millions of people across the planet. I think this is going to be a really fascinating discussion. Yeah, I'm excited about it because it is funny that I came on so long ago and discussed social capital because one of the principles that we teach on the Jordan Harbinger show. And if my voice sounds familiar and you say, isn't that the art of charm guy? The answer is, was the art of charm guy. (laughs) I've left that company. I no longer host that show. There really isn't much of one going right now. And I do the Jordan Harbinger show, which is the same sort of quality interviews that people were used to before and the advice. But the way that that happened was not at all what had been planned. You know, what had been planned was a nice smooth transition and then the negotiations sort of fell apart which is ironic for a company that teaches relationship skills and i'm sure you've gotten some pushback and some flack on that i'm sure of it actually i haven't because i think it's probably pretty obvious for most people that when one side says it's an amicable split and they're like oh so jordan built a show for 11 years and founded a company and then suddenly left with the whole team and now is not having anything to do with it yeah that sounds amicable right (laughs) sure sure there's some red flags there right there's a few flags there that an educated smart person might see through and so that's kind of what i'm i'm going through right now which is like a split that was sudden not designed at all by let's say our side of the fence And so it's been completely reactive. And what that did was cause a lot of stress and anxiety for those people on my team, because almost the entire team, the majority of the staff came with me on this journey, this unintentional adventure. And one of the principles that I teach at our courses and things like that about networking and relationship development is always give without the expectation of anything in return. So you've seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, always be closing, right? You've seen that, you know that scene? Sure, yeah, of course. So we have ABG, which is always be generous or always be giving. What that essentially lines up to is helping other people without the expectation of anything in return. Now, when you're helping other people without the expectation of anything in return, that's great because it's sort of like a privileged thing to do. You're in this very abundant, I hate words like that, but you're in this very abundant position where it's like, look, I can make 25 email introductions for Ryan Mickler. I don't mind. He's a nice person. I can do that. I don't lose anything, right? I don't, I'm not going to go, hey, Ryan, I need $20 per introduction. Or since I did that for you, I want to sleep on your couch for three weeks. Like, I'm not doing that. This isn't quid pro quo. But When you do that for a long enough period of time and you're giving without the expectation of anything in return, often I'm not asking for anything in return. However, now I'm in a scenario where I'm going, oh crap, I really need other people's help now. So I gave without the expectation of anything in return, but I really believed that I would never need anything in return from most of these folks that I helped. Thank God I did that because right now, starting from basically zero with the Jordan Harbinger show, I can either spend another 11 years rebuilding the show or I can do here, which is in the matter of just a few weeks, 700 iTunes reviews, 
almost a million downloads of the new show and having people tweet it out and mail it out and having influencers like Kevin Rose and Kevin Harrington from Shark Tank tweeting it, mailing it out, you know, just opportunities like coming on your show, Order of Man, to speak with your audience. These are things that if I was unknown to you or if I had never struck up a relationship with you by hanging out in various places or, or whatever, coming on the show and having you do other stuff for us before, if those hadn't been in place, I would be in a very, very, very different situation right now that would look a lot more bleak because it's easy when you're on the top of the mountain. You know, The Art of Charm, when I was hosting it, had 4.1 million downloads. Yeah. I mean, that was insane. It took 11 years to get there. That was crazy. I could have easily just been like, oh, well, I'm important now, so screw everyone. But I, that's not really my style, as you may or may not have noticed from, from knowing me for the past I, few years. I think I, I figured that. Well, what's interesting even is about, let's just take the example of you reaching out to me, which I think was probably... I don't know, two or three weeks ago, specifically about, hey, can I come on the show? There wasn't a question in my mind at all. Like, oh, I don't know. Like, I don't know this Jordan guy or what he wants to talk about. It was like, yeah, absolutely. Because we have built up that friendship and we have built up that social capital with each other that when the time comes that you need a favor, it's not like, well, did he do enough favors for me to warrant me doing this one favor for him? There wasn't even really a score. It was just, hey, I want to help a friend out and I want to see you succeed. And because I want to see you succeed, nothing other than that. Yeah, that's important because I think what a lot of young, and I'm going to say guys because your audience is men, but when I say this, I mean people. I mean, anybody listening is in this boat. What we do is we go, okay, well, I don't know what I can get from Jordan mm -hmm. or from Ryan because I'm a graphic designer and I don't know what those guys have. So I'm not going to look for ways to help them right now unless they, maybe, maybe I would if they asked me because I'm a nice person, but I'm not thinking of ways I can help them per se because I don't know what I would get. The problem with that is if you're not helping other people without the expectation of anything in return, you only see the opportunities that you're going for, right? Mm. So I needed to come on order of man to help people realize that I'd left the art of charm because I never got a chance to say goodbye to the audience and I started the Jordan Harbinger show. So this is utilitarian for me. However, if this was the first time we had ever spoken or that email that I sent was the first time we'd ever spoken, you would not have said yes. Well, I would assume you probably wouldn't have said yes because it would have been kind of like, hey, person I've never heard of before or that never spoke to me when you thought you were a big shot with your podcast. It's the dozens of other emails that I get every single week like, hey, I've got something that I want to share with your audience. It's like, okay, great, but I don't know who you are. So it would have got lost in everything else that I hear in the noise. Here's my infographic. Please post it on your website. <laughs> yes, that's, that's my, that's, that's what's happening to me now. What's, what is that? There's some sort of thing with infographics. Now. The one for me is the beard, beard infographics. Like you wouldn't believe all the time. Would you like to share this? No, I would not like to share this. Thank you though. You must have written the word beard on a couple of blog posts and now you're just showing up first in Google for like beards. Yeah. <laughs> so that's your fault. Yeah. That's, Shave. That's right. <laughs> I am really curious though, cause I want to go back to something you said. You said the majority of the team went with you. And I think that's pretty telling. It's probably easy to gloss over to, but there's got to be a reason for that. Like, why would your team risk their livelihood, frankly, and say, all right, I'm going to strike it out with Jordan. It almost reminds me of, um, oh, what's that show with Tom Cruise where he's like, who's coming with me? You know oh, what I mean? Yeah. Jerry Maguire, Jerry right? Maguire. Yes. Why would they go with you? I'm really curious about your perspective on that. Yeah. So I would love to say I stood up in the art of charm office, which doesn't exist <laughs> and say, you know, because it was in my house. Now it's the Jordan Harbinger show office um, and say, who's coming with me? And then my wife who works next to me is like, I guess I will. Yeah. Right. That, that's not really what happened, though. What happened first was uh, I'm, I've got to be careful because this is an ongoing legal situation. But basically, I think the people on the team had already had issues with what was going on behind the scenes and they were already working more closely with each other. And so when I left, that included the podcast team, which went, well, we're not working here without you because we do the show and you're part of the show. I host the show. We're not going to sit here and work with the rest of the people that are left. And so that sort of congealed into a mass of people that went, yeah, well, if you're leaving, I'm leaving. And then other people were also dismissed. And then it was like, well, if that person's leaving, then da, da, da. And so that just sort of snowball effect and then it was like, well, people who could have stayed decided not to, other people were terminated, and then still other people were just like, well, I don't really have anything to do here anymore. So frankly, you know, I gotta say, if you're working for a company and everybody that you know that you thought was talented worked there and left, you might not wanna stick around. Yeah, good point. 
you know, I have to be careful about how I phrase all this because I don't want to damage the business that I left because I still own a part of it. It's just, it didn't turn out the way that it was supposed to and agreed upon previously. I'd like to say, oh, well, once I left, everybody decided, screw this place and let, that's not what happened. You know, what happened was there was some of that, but most of it was probably a little more nuanced. But I have thought, like, wouldn't it have been cool if I could have stood up in the office that we don't have and said, I'm striking out on my own. Who's coming with me? But the truth is, Ryan, my team, my immediate team, they were already wanting me to leave a long time ago, but they went, this is never going to happen. Why would he leave a company that he started, that he owns, that he's been running for 11 years, just because we have gripes with management? And it's like, well, I had that choice sort of made for me at that point because there was no other option that was realistic for me. So it's strange to look at it because it's like, oh my God, I can't sleep for all these times and this is so stressful. And now what happened was I immediately started leaning on my network and relationships because I had been giving without the expectation of anything in return. I hadn't been keeping score with other people like you kind of mentioned. And I had all these other strategies in place. So the first thing I did was I sat down with Jen. Well, first thing I did was probably like, walk around my neighborhood in disbelief. Oh, sure. I'm just like freak out, I'm sure. Yeah, there was some freak out. And then it was like, call the lawyer. And then it was like, calm down. <laughs> and then it was make a spreadsheet of everybody that I should call right now. Hmm. And in fact, this is a thought exercise that I would love to give the order of man legionnaires. Is that what you call it? <laughs> your, I like that. That's not what I call them, but I do like that. Yeah, you should. I, you know, I thought you gave that to me, but maybe not. Okay. Well, well, I don't think so. You gave it to me just barely. So the Legionnaire sounds badass. Um, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Cause I, I know so many guys in your group that love it. Um, well, anyway, I'm calling them Legionnaires today. <laughs> so, right on. so let's roll with it. The homework is imagine you got laid off from your job today or your business just evaporated. You know, you showed up and your computer was like, Nope, not letting you check your email. You're fired. You know, even if it's your own business, who are the 10 or 20 people that you'd contact to solicit their advice on what to do next and people that you would ask for help. And so make the list now and then reach out to those people now when you don't need anything. Because what I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen this too, is, hey, whoa, I can't believe my caller ID. What's going on, man? Oh man, I'm kicked out of my house. I need to borrow $800. And you're like, what? Uh, yeah, I haven't talked to you for t three years or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, or 10 years. And you're just like, what the? And they're like, oh, yeah, things, you know, life gets in the way. And I'm just thinking, no, you just just didn't reach out. Yeah, we're just not friends. And now you need something. When you reach out to these guys, I mean, and I'm talking about before you, you know, quote unquote, need anything. Yeah. What type of contact are you making with them? Is it simply just, hey, man, thinking of you, hope all is well? Or is it something deeper than that? What does that actually look like? Yeah, you know, at first I thought, okay, I've got to have a strategy whereby I give value and I, it's got to be an article or something. And I still advise people to do that if they're cold outreaching. You know, if you've never emailed Ryan Mickler and you're like, oh, hey, look, I got to reach out. Or for me, I'm a sucker for weird news about North Korea and stuff like that. So if you email Jordan at jordanharbinger.com and you send me something interesting, I might be like, wow, that was really random. Cool. Thanks, man. But if you know me already, if you and I hadn't talked for three years, I might just send you a text or an email that says, hey, man, I'm in San Diego. In fact, I think I did email you this. And if I didn't, I should have. I was in San Diego last week and I was like, oh, I remember walking this same path with Ryan Mickler. Yeah, like, you did. You sent me a message. Yep, I did. OK, that's an example of. I would say using it's called opportunistic network maintenance, and that's a fancy term for you log into Facebook. Oh, this person in my newsfeed, I have not had a chance to talk with them for a while. Oh, this other person in my newsfeed had a baby. Wow. Okay. That's cool. I, I should send him a text, not just click like, yeah. which is what a lot of people do. Seven. That is the number of spots that we have left guys for this year's uprising. If you aren't familiar with what that is now, is the time to head to orderofman.com slash uprising and learn a little bit more about this three and a half day men's event in the mountains of Southern Utah. This experience is going to be held on May 3rd through the 6th, 2018. And it's unlike anything that you've ever seen. We've got firearms training from a Navy SEAL, self-defense training, survival training. We've got physical, mental, and emotional challenges. We've got amazing food, amazing scenery. We do firesides each and every night. All of this is designed to do one thing, guys, just one very simple thing jar you out of the reality in which you have found yourself. 
the reality is that most of us are living in a position of stagnation. And there's no wonder that you're not producing the results that you're after. This experience, the uprising experience will give you a new foundation, a new framework, a new lens at which to view your life moving forward. And that's what we want to do. We want to give you the tools, the skills, the resources, the ability to transform your life in your relationships, your business, your bank account, your body, every aspect of your life. So if you're interested, at least want to know a little bit more about what we're up to, you've got to do it very quickly. Again, we have seven spots. All you have to do is get to Las Vegas on May 3rd. We will take care of the rest. We'll bring you back down to Las Vegas on May 6th. So if you are interested, head to orderofman.com slash uprising, orderofman.com slash uprising. I hope to see you there. Now, with that said, let's get back to the conversation with Jordan. This is actually really interesting. One of the things that I did, and this specifically with my financial planning practice, is I had so many financial advisors look at me really strange when I did this. I'm like, if you guys aren't on Facebook, using that as a tool to maintain contact with your existing clients, like you are completely missing the boat. Because what I would do is I'd jump on Facebook and I would friend every client that I had, which a lot of advisors were afraid to do. And if they had a baby or went on a vacation or had some exciting news or their kid made Allstate or whatever it may be, that was an opportunity for me to connect with these people in a way that was meaningful outside of the work that we were contracted to do together. It was really, really powerful. Yeah, that's a great opportunity. And I think the reason people are afraid to do that is they go, oh, you know, maybe it's invasive. Some people use Facebook only for their friends. And, you know, I don't want to be invading their privacy. Ask yourself this financial planner and everybody else who has a client-based business, do you think your friends are more likely to do business with you or a total stranger? And the answer is obviously your friends. We do business with people that we know, like, and trust. So why in the hell, if we're doing business with people we know, like, and trust, would we decide to not become friends and get to know, like, and trust the people that just walked into our office, for God's sake? It's like the easiest layup in the world to do business with a friend. And so you can reverse engineer the process too and say, hey, it's good to meet you. You know, we're gonna be in business for years. I'm not gonna then go, oh, but I, I'm gonna stay out of your personal life. Right. It's like, if you don't want someone in your personal life, don't post that crap on Facebook. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? It's like the people who put the little things like, this is my information and Facebook can't share it. The little legal disclaimers. I'm yeah. Like, Dude, you gave that right up a long time ago when you set up a Facebook account. Exactly. It's in the fine print when you create the account and you can't yes. change the agreement, especially while you're using the service. <laughs> you know, right. give me a break. The, the, you don't own the copyright. Like, that's so ridiculous to me. And look, if someone is listening right now and they're like, no, I would, I'm very private. If somebody tried to add me on Facebook, I would decline. Okay, decline then. But unless you're unreasonable, you're not gonna go, how dare you try to add me on Facebook, Ryan? You're just my financial planner. How dare you? That's a weird reaction and you don't wanna work with that person anyway. That's like an uncalibrated weirdo thing to do is get mad if someone tries to add you. You might just go, hey, you know, I only have my family on here because we share a lot of sensitive information. You have their freaking money, right? okay? Like that's more personal for most people than their sex life. And you know this, you know this because you've all heard your guy friends be like, yeah, I, me and my wife did this crazy thing in bed the other day. And then you're like, cool, are you saving for retirement? And they're like, how dare you? Why would you ask me about that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so like it's more personal. Money is more personal than sex any day for most people, especially guys. And so if you're in that business or any business where people are doing financial transactions with you, you should be endeavoring to become closer with them. And of course, respecting their personal boundaries that they won't add you, but there's no reason not to add people on social media and things like that. And the reason that sort of opportunistic network maintenance, like seeing people in your newsfeed, using that as an opportunity, is the mirror image or, or the foil, to use ninth grade English terminology, of the following, which is systematic network maintenance. So I, I have this product called Contactually, and it's run by my friends V Band or Bond. It's really great. It's not free, but it is worth it. And what it does is it goes in your Gmail. You play a little game where you drop people into buckets, and the buckets are like contact every 90 days, contact every 30 days, contact every six months, contact every year. Their birthday is this, blah, 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 blah. And then every day it sends you an email and it's like, hey, you haven't talked to Ryan Mickler in 90 days. You wanna send an email? You click yes, and then it goes, hey, Ryan, what's going on? It's Jordan, we haven't spoken in a while. So it basically just systematically reminds me to reach out to people. Some people will say that's cheating. I say try keeping in touch with 1,500 people a year. 
Well, not only is it not cheating, I think it's a compliment. I look at it like if I'm in your contextually database, for example, I actually look at that as a compliment because I'm like, oh, Jordan at least cares enough about this relationship to create a system to make sure that we stay in touch other than just when it happens, it happens. So I look at it as somebody who's actually invested to some degree in the relationship. Exactly. And look, you're not a robot. You're not going to remember everybody's deal and everybody's birthday and everybody's little engagement. So that's why we use systematic and opportunistic at the same time, because then we can use Facebook for the big stuff like, oh my God, you got engaged. Oh my God, you got married. Or, oh my gosh, you got a new car. You can use that then. And then every other time, which is most of the rest of your year, you just have, hey, I haven't talked to you in a while. I know you had a baby last time we spoke because you can add notes to contactually. It's like last we spoke, I texted him about his new kid. Right. It's like, how's everything going? That's how you keep in touch with people in a way that's effective. The other thing I'll, I'll say this is when you're using opportunistic networking maintenance, like on Facebook and social media, don't just click like or write a comment. If you see a big life event, if there was a flow chart where it was like less than, less than, less than, a like is less than a comment, which is less than an email, which is less than a text message, in my opinion, that's debatable, which is less than a phone call, which is less than meeting in person. Sure. So if you see someone with a big life event, don't click like, don't leave a comment, send them a text if you have their phone number because fewer people are doing that. If you don't have their phone number, send them an email. More people are doing that. It's easier to get lost. But if they're near you or you're like, hey, I'm in Chicago or I'm gonna be there in two months, go out for a beer or get a coffee or go meet their new baby even though you haven't caught up with him and his wife since their wedding. Hmm. That's better. It's better in that, that effort of going to visit someone at their house you are now more invested than somebody that they have been texting or emailing back and forth with for three to five years, period. It's almost like when you get reminders of so-and-so's birthday on Facebook and a thousand people send a happy birthday and it's like, dude, why don't you just pick up your phone and shoot a text real quick and say, ha you can say the same thing in a text yep. and yet you're going to be the one that stands out or a phone call because you just took that extra 30 seconds it took to do that. And now look, in the age of smartphones, man, I know whenever anybody says that, I'm like, you're old. Yeah, right. um, in the age of smartphones. Was there an age without smartphones? There was. <laughs> let me tell you. Let me tell you, boy. There was. And so make a video. It's like, oh, hey, Ryan, happy birthday. We haven't talked in a minute. I'm really glad that you are healthy and your beard's looking even better and redder than it ever has. And that's pretty much it for me. Hope to see you again sometime soon. That's better than a text that says happy birthday and has a balloon emoji. Right. Facebook reminded me. Yeah. They got 50 of those. It's still better than a like on their birthday message. It's still better than a Facebook message, but a video is better than that. And like I said, giving someone a phone call, even if they don't answer, you know, just, hey, I left you a message. You probably don't check voicemail. Just want to let you know. Happy birthday. Really appreciate you. It's simple. And you can do this for 20 minutes a day on your morning commute if you have one. It's not something that's going to radically alter your schedule. But what it will do is it will radically alter your life. Because what I've said earlier cannot be understated, which is I would be so screwed right now if all I had were... And look, I've got 11 years worth of skills in broadcasting, right? Sure. Yeah, you're not going to lose that. I'm not going to lose that. I've got a great team. Thankfully, they came along for the ride in part because of some of the skills that we're talking about with social capital here. But the other thing is, man, the network has been by and large the best thing. If someone said, okay, I'm going to give you a million dollars in cash right now but you can't have anyone around you other than like your wife and family or even, or even your staff but you get a million dollars in cash and start over, I would never accept that offer. Hmm. Because what I'm getting from these relationships right now that I need them, which is like a lot of show appearances, people spreading the word, all the goodwill that I've got, being able to book guests for the Jordan Harbinger show, that is worth much more than a million dollars in cash, especially after California taxes. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> How did you feel when you actually started to reach out to me and others to ask for some favors, ask for some help, ask for the things that you needed. Like what's going through your mind? Is that a difficult thing? Does ego get in the way? Like what does that actually feel like and look like? It was kind of funny in the beginning because I went, oh my God, I need to ask people for help. Right. And a lot of my friends were like, oh man, you know, are you nervous about that? Or are you worried about that? Because some people were like, oh, you're going to find out who your friends are. And when you hear that, 
you hear it from like a professional athlete on an ESPN special who finds out that nobody cares about him anymore, that he's retired and has no money. It's like when MC Hammer found out that all of his friends that he had spent all this money on, like they didn't care about him anymore because he went broke. <laughs> right. So like that's what you hear about. And I was worried about that because I was worried that, oh no, maybe these people are right. Maybe my value, my identity was only as the host of The Art of Charm and wasn't just Jordan Harbinger and wasn't, you know, and then I found out immediately that that wasn't true. Right. I sent out some softballs because I was like, Ryan's going to help me, you know, other folks that I'm close with whose names I won't drop on your show because there's no point. You know, those people will all help me. And what I did is I sort of softballed that and those people were like, yeah, let's get on a call tomorrow. I'm going to book you on Art of Manliness next month. It's going to be great. And I was like, this is really helpful, you know, coming on Order of Man. So that boosted my confidence a little bit to the point where I was like, okay, well, these guys are already helping me. So if the next 50 or 80 people say no, I'm going to be okay. At least you got this in the queue, right? Yeah, exactly. I've got these birds in the hand or whatever. And then I reached out to other folks and what happened was really surprising. What happened was... I reached out to other folks and they said, yes, I'll help you. And I should introduce you to this guy, Steve Gordon. And then I'd get introduced to Steve Gordon and Steve Gordon would go, oh, hey, what's up, man? Big fan of what you guys are doing. I should introduce you to these five people. And then I'd get introduced to them and they'd go, hey, I know you probably have a lot on your plate, but I would also love to introduce you to these four. And so now I find myself in this position where not only have my friends been helping me, but my friends, friends, friends are now like, yeah, great. Let's figure out what we can do, man. You know, let's make this happen. Some of that sure is, oh, this guy listened to Art of Charm three years ago and liked what we had created and now listens to the Jordan Harbinger show or we met at some conference or something like that. But a lot of it is just, oh, hey, I, you know, my friend said you were kind of in trouble and I want to help out because people like helping other people. Right. They do. They just need an opportunity to do it, right? Right, right. And you and I are like that too. But since we're in sort of a public figure-ish position, it's a little different because people are asking us for stuff all the time. So I made the mistake of thinking, oh man, I'm going to look like one of these guys who's asking for stuff that I don't know that reach out and end up in my inbox. But that wasn't what happened. What happened was I reached out and asked for something and people went, oh, finally an opportunity to help this person who's made introductions for me or who has reached out about this or who was nice to me at this conference or who bought me a drink once three years ago. That kind of stuff has been paying dividends. And that was surprising because I had thought people are going to see me as a mooch or something. And that that didn't happen because I'd already done the work. I dug the well before I was thirsty. Now I'm thirsty, but I spent 10, 11, 12 years digging this well unintentionally, not unintentionally, sorry, very deliberately, but not going one day I'm going to call these guys and it's going to be a thing. Right. You weren't gaming it. Yeah. There was no gaming the system at best. I thought one day, maybe someday, possibly I'll write a book and I'll have to call these people and do a press tour with them or something. But it was so not conscious at all. It was just like that may or may not happen in the next decade. And if it does, great. And even then, you have to get used to helping people without the expectation of anything in return and do the ABG because look, if you help 100 people, 90 of them, you just might never hear from them again. And if you're keeping score or you're sort of secretly in the back of your head thinking that you'll be able to count on them later, you will universally be disappointed. And what that'll do is it will stop you from wanting to always be generous and always be giving and helping other people without that expectation because you're going to feel burned because you're secretly keeping score in your head and that's poisoning the relationships that you're creating. I think it's important that you do get used to helping, like you said, but to go back to what we were talking about a minute ago, I think it's also important that you get used to accepting opportunities as well. Yes. And I think we have a really hard time doing that, especially when our egos get in the way. Like one thing I always run against is people will email me or shoot me a text or a Facebook message and say, Hey man, I really love what you're doing. Can I help you with something? Please let me know. And I try to make a very, very conscious effort of always accepting that offer. And it might just be, dude, just leave me a review or share this episode or connect me with this person that you know, because I don't want to rob that person of the opportunity to serve. And that's, that's what they're asking. They want to serve. They want to help. And so who are we to say, nope, sorry, I deny that gift from you. You know, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that because a lot of times people will ask to help. First of all, people have been asking for internships for the Jordan Harbinger show and for my previous businesses for the, as long as the business has been running. And it's never been a good experience when I've said, sure, come on in. It's universally just cost me tons of money and headache and time. And mm -hmm. so I usually am like, oh, I don't want to deal with this. But you're right. A lot of people, they want to serve. And, and so a way that I've found that if you're listening to this and you are a business owner of even a small business, 
create a Facebook group. This is probably super obvious for people who are in their 20s, but for me at 38, it was like, oh, good idea. Create a Facebook group. I just created the Jordan Harbinger Show Facebook group recently because we had hundreds of emails in my inbox at jordanharbinger.com, and it was like, how can I help? I wanna help you rebuild this. I'm a huge fan, what can we do? And I just kept saying, yeah, leave us a review, and it's like, this is kind of a waste, right? Because these people, they wanna share. It's like, I can either have a separate email list of all these people and then bug them, or they can join a Facebook group and I'll post a new episode in there, and it's like, all right, street team, share this widely, and they do. Sure. And why not assemble those people and get them buying into what you're doing because they want that anyway. Like you said, they want to serve. So it makes a lot of sense to allow them to do this. You know, it doesn't it doesn't make sense to not accept that simply because you can't see the opportunity between you and that person. Like I said earlier, all those opportunities are over the horizon. You have to help other people without the expectation of anything in return. It's foolish not to let other people help you without the expectation of anything in return. Right. Great point. Well, hey, man, I hate to cut us short. I know you've got a hard stop. I've got a hard stop. We could continue this conversation all day long. And of course, I recommend anybody who's listening to this show to check out your show, The Jordan Harbinger Show, because it'll get a lot of this information and so much more. But before we wind things down, I didn't prepare you today, but you've answered it twice. So I've got to ask you to answer it a third time. And that question is, what does it mean to be a man? Oh, that's interesting. You're right. I have answered this twice. Watch I say like the complete opposite of something I'd said before. So I got to be careful. There. I don't think we have. I mean, we've got 157 or eight interviews now and not one of them are the same. So don't worry about that, man. Oh, interesting. Yeah, this is an evolving question for me. And what I've noticed in my life recently is that there's a lot of easy ways out. Oh, I'll network later. I don't want to figure this out. Oh, I'll sleep in today, but I will, you know, oh, I'll go to the gym tomorrow. I'll, you know, I'll set a better example when I know people are watching. It really is, in a way, doing the hard thing. You know, this isn't a universal definition, but doing the hard thing. You know, if I see dirty dishes in the sink, sometimes I'll wash them. Not all the time, because I'm often running around the house, literally. But it's like, I could look at them and go, yeah, my wife will get to that later. Why? Why should I leave that for her? Or the other day, I saw a perfect cat butthole shaped stain on the wall. I'll let you guess how that got there. And I was like, oh, that's weird. You know, Jen will scrape that off. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm just gonna wipe this thing off. Why am I waiting? And it's, it's kind of just like do the hard thing. Oh, I gotta bring these boxes downstairs. Oh, you know, if I leave it there long enough, someone else will get it. It's like, no, you know, do the hard thing. And I don't always follow that rule because nobody's perfect, but I'll tell you, it's really nice because people notice it and they appreciate it. And when I talk to guys like Jocko, he's all about that too. If you sense some sort of weakness in yourself, just lean into it. And even if that weakness is, oh man, look at all these cups. I don't wanna clean that crap up. If I leave it there, you know, my housekeeper or my wife or my sister-in-law will get it. No, don't do that. Just do the hard thing. You know, that's what being a man is about, is leaning into weakness, even when that weakness is your own willpower or lack thereof. Right on, man. That's powerful. How do we connect with you and learn more about what you're doing and find out more? Sure. So you're listening to a podcast. You don't have to buy anything from me. I'm not selling anything. In fact, just check out the Jordan Harbinger show. It's all about mindsets and mental models. So we study the thoughts, the actions, the habits of brilliant people. I ask them what I think are interesting questions and deliver their superpowers to the listener. And the thing is, every episode has worksheets. So that's how big on practicals we are. Every episode has worksheets. It's not just like, I feel so inspired right now. It's like, <laughs> no, here are things you can do that you can write down, that you can execute, that are going to make you better in some way immediately. Not like, oh, if you keep listening to this under your pillow, you'll wake up a different man after 10 years. That's not how this works for me. It's all about action. And so that's what the Jordan Harbinger show is. So look, take action and subscribe to the Jordan Harbinger show and let me know what you think of it. You know, if you think it stinks, I'm curious why. If you think it's great, that's less important, but also very nice to hear. Right on, man. We'll link it all up for you. I got to tell you, I appreciate you and our friendship over the past three years. You've always been helpful for me. You've always gone out of your way to make introductions and help me succeed in this business. And, and I'm honored to have the opportunity to help you in a small way too. So appreciate your friendship, brother. Thanks for coming on the show. Likewise, man. I'm excited to read your book. Gentlemen, there it is. My conversation with my good friend, Jordan Harbinger. I know that you probably got as much value out of this conversation as I did. Like I said, before we even started, always so much, so much information that he has to share. And I've appreciated his friendship. And again, I wish it was under different circumstances, but it is very fascinating and very enlightening 
to see him now use the skills that he's been teaching to other people in his own life to make this new business a success. So do him a favor, do me a favor, uh, connect with him, connect with me on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, wherever you're doing social media, we're at both places. And we'd love to hear from you. What was your biggest takeaway? What are you going to implement in your life? What are you going to change about your life having listened to this conversation? So if you would, go ahead and take care of that. And then also make sure you subscribe to this show. We've had some very, very amazing guests come on in the recent weeks, and I've got a lot of great guests coming on in the very near future. So you want to make sure you subscribe so you do not miss a single episode. And then leave us a review. If you would, I don't ask this a whole lot, but just go ahead and leave us an iTunes rating and review. That goes such a long way in sharing what we're doing here. And as you know, as you know, we need more guys in the fight. And the best way that I can do that is through the podcast. And the way that you can help me and your fellow brothers do that is to share this, is to leave an iTunes rating and review. So guys, take care of that. Outside of that, we've got our Iron Council, our exclusive brotherhood. You can check that out at orderofman.com slash Iron Council. We've got the In the Trenches podcast episode that is going to be released every Wednesday. You'll want to check that out. And then of course, we've got the Uprising experience. You won't hear me talk about that much more because we are almost filled up. We've got seven spots left and I know that this thing is going to fill up. So orderofman.com slash uprising. Get on that quick. So with that, guys, I will sign out for today. Uh, As always, I appreciate you being here. I thank you for being here. I thank you for standing shoulder to shoulder with me in this mission and this purpose of reclaiming what it means to be a genuine man. Uh, Until Friday, guys, take action and become the man you are meant to be. Thank you for listening to the Order of Man podcast. If you're ready to take charge of your life and be more of the man you were meant to be, we invite you to join the order at orderofman.com. 